Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're gonna be finishing up section 5.2 uh, from your textbook, which introduced you guys to the concept of orthogonality and also the idea of an orthogonal basis for a given vector space. Um, so in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at just a couple more examples and then also talk about how or why an orthogonal basis is actually useful and see how it can really give us an easy or at least alternative way for determining component representations of vectors for a given basis. But before we do that, we're going to just um, do one quick sort of practice example just to make sure we're still comfortable with the concept of orthogonality and also to talk about, even though it's not really something that we're going to go too far to in our course, but the idea of what is called an orthogonal complement, um, which is actually a special type of subspace. So for this example, uh, we're going to try to determine all the vectors in M23. So all the vectors in the sort of two by three uh, matrices that are orthogonal to the vectors that consist of the two matrices 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And we're going to be using that standard inner product that we've been using for matrices, which is the trace of the transpose times the other matrix. Right. So um, as I'm going to make a note here, um, if you guys were to take like a full course in linear algebra at some point, you would find out that this sort of set that we're going to be determining, all the vectors that are orthogonal uh, to these two, is actually a subspace, and it's called the orthogonal complement of these vectors. So it's sort of an interesting idea that if you find the all the vectors that are orthogonal to these, that's actually a closed subspace. And I believe in some of the suggested exercises, you can actually see proofs of that, in that if you have two vectors that are orthogonal to another vector, summing them remains orthogonal. And if you take a scalar multiple of a vector that is orthogonal to another vector, that scalar multiple is still orthogonal, which is why it will be a subspace. Not gonna be super important for our class, but it is a nice extension of some of the things we're doing. Just to get a little practice with orthogonality though, we're gonna to try to determine all the vectors that are orthogonal to these two. So let's go ahead and think about what a general vector in here looks like. So if V is an element of the M two by three of R, this implies, right, that that vector V looks something like maybe A, B, C, D, E, F, right? It's gotta be a two by three matrix, right? And so those six components. Now, if this guy is supposed to be orthogonal to this, let's think about what that implies. So if V is supposed to be orthogonal to 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, that would imply that if we go ahead and do the inner product of A, B, C, D, E, F, along with this guy, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, then what that would be is that would be the trace, and then we would have to take the transpose of this guy. So that would be A, B, C, D, E, F. And then we'd have to multiply it with that 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, then if we were doing that, we'd start doing our matrix multiplication. So this times this. So we would get the trace of we said first row, first column, that would be like uh, A plus D. Uh, then we would do first row, second column, but of course that wouldn't apply to the trace, so I guess we can just skip it and skip that guy and skip that guy. But we will need to do the second row in the second column, which will give us uh, B plus E. And then of course we can uh, sort of skip the next one, skip the next one, skip the next one, then we just need to do the last row times the last column, which gives us zero there. So we'd have something that looks like that. And of course the trace of that would be A plus D plus B plus E. Well, if these guys are orthogonal, then it implies that this, which we now know is this, must be equal to zero. So this must equal zero. So what we've just figured out is that A plus D plus B plus E must equal zero. And that, if this is true, that'll ensure that our vector is orthogonal to this guy. But that's not the only thing that must be true. We also need it to be orthogonal to this guy. So let's go ahead and see what that tells us. So V being orthogonal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, that implies that if we take a look at A, B, C, D, E, F, and we do the inner product with this guy, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And if we start to do that inner product, right, that would be the trace of 
transpose, so A, B, C, D, E, F, times this guy, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And if we start to do that, that would be the trace. Once again, we'll just focus on the diagonal elements. First row, first column, that's going to be 0. And then something, something, something. Second row, second column, also 0. Something, something, something. Last one, C ti CF times 1, 1 gives us C plus F. Okay, so that then tells us that this trace would be C plus F, and that would need to equal 0. So we also know, so C plus F needs to be 0. So in other words, what we basically know is that A plus D plus B plus E must be equal to 0, and C plus F must be equal to 0. Let's go ahead and rewrite that on our next page to sort of summarize what we found so far. So what we've basically found is that A plus D plus B, I believe, sorry, yep, we just put them in their alphabetic order. A plus B plus D plus E must equal 0, and C plus F must be equal to 0. Now, if you look at this, this is actually a system of equations, right? It's a linear system of equations, and if you wanted to, you could really quickly just imagine it in sort of row echelon or in a matrix form, right? It would be something like 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 needs to be 0, and then 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, 1 would be 0. Now, how do I know where to put these? Well, I'm just imagining it going A, B, C, D, E, F. So you'll notice that this one has a 1 for the A, a 1 for the B, a 1 for the D, and 1 for E, whereas this one only has 1 for C and 1 for F. Now, in this, you can already see that it is in row echelon form, so we'd be ready to sort of back solve. The ones we'd want to avoid parameterizing would be we'd want to avoid uh, A and C here, and we'd let the other ones sort of be free. So we could say, let's go ahead and, I don't know, we can let... Uh, B be equal to T, uh, we can let D be equal to S, E be equal to R, and I guess F be equal uh, to mm, TSR, I, don't know, I guess we can just use like a K or something, since we're sort of running out of standard parameter letters there. So what that would then tell us is that A would need to be negative T minus S uh, minus R, and C would need to be negative K. So there we go. And what that tells us is that that set of vectors, set of vectors orthogonal to both, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, is S equals all the things that look like negative t minus s minus r. For b, we said t. For c, we said negative k. Uh, for d, we said s. e, we said r. And c, and sorry, uh, f, we said k. So they're all the things that look like that. There we go. So all the things that sort of fit this format, where t K, R, and S can be anything you want, will be the set of all vectors that are orthogonal to both of these. Now, I we didn't prove this, but we sort of said on the side that this guy would be a subspace, and you can imagine how you could use this to form a basis, right? Just as a sort of side note, note a basis for S would be, well, just take each parameter one at a time and treat it as equal to one and treat all the others as equal to zero. So if we did t as equal to 1, we would get something like minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, if we did s uh, as 1, looks like we get minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. If we did r as 1, we'd get negative 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. And if we did k as 1, we'd get 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 1. So a basis for us would be this. And if you guys want, you can sort of check uh, sort of manually that if you take any of these guys, you pick any one of these, these will always be orthogonal to both of these. So if you choose this guy, for example, you can test this guy is orthogonal to both this and to this. 
Okay, so this was just a little bit of a sort of a warm up to remind you guys about like what orthogonality means and how we're sort of working with it. Um, orthogonal complements or orthogonal subspaces is an interesting idea in uh, linear algebra in general, but it's not something we're going to touch on too much. I did also just want to bring back the concept of a basis here, sort of interesting. Again, once you have the general element of what's inside of a subspace, it is very easy to determine a basis. To really wrap up this section 5.2, though, the main thing we want to focus on is if we have an orthogonal basis, how that helps us actually determine the component representation of a given factor. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So for to start off with, we've got a definition here. We're going to let V be an inner product space. Then the projection of vector V onto vector U is given by the vector that we write P v comma u, so projection of v onto u. It's the inner product of v and u divided by the norm of u squared times the vector u. So you will notice that the projection of v onto u is a vector. It's a scalar multiple of the vector u. So in other words, right, the projection of a vector v onto a different vector u is some scalar multiple of that vector u. Now, as one side note, this is the sort of notation that your book uses for this, but do be aware that this is exactly the same as V U inner product over U inner product with U, because what's the definition of the norm here? The norm is the square root of the inner product with itself. So the norm squared is just the inner product with itself and then times U. Do keep in mind also this part here, this inner product over another inner product, this is just a number, it's a scalar, and then it's times the vector you're projecting onto. So the projection is a vector, but this component here is just a scalar. Okay, so why do we bother with this definition? Well, it turns out that if you understand this concept of a projection, then it is very easy to figure out the component representation if you have an orthogonal basis. So the big theorem here is that if you have V1 through Vn is an orthogonal basis, so not just any basis, but an orthogonal basis for some inner product space V, then any vector V in that vector space can be uniquely represented as V equals the projection of V onto V1 plus the projection of V onto V2 plus all the way down the projection of V onto Vn. So we are going to prove this right in just a moment. Now, I do want to just call attention to some of the things that, and we'll, we'll state this as we do our proof, but keep in mind that some of this statement, while it sounds really nice or cool or, or sort of fancy, we actually already know. This uniquely represented, that is actually something we already know. Because if V1 through Vn is a basis, one of the things we proved is that if you have a basis, every vector can be uniquely represented in that basis. So the fact that it's uniquely represented isn't the main point. The main point is that that unique representation happens to be the sum of all the projections. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about how we would prove this. So as our proof, since V1 through Vn is a basis, we already know there exist unique C1 through Cn such that V equals C1 V1 plus C2 V2 plus dot 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 Cn Vn. This is something we proved way back to when we actually introduced the concept of a basis. So we know if V1 through Vn is a basis, then there are unique constants so that any vector V is a linear combination of those basis elements. What this theorem is claiming is that these C1 C2 Cn's, these constants, need to match the constants in those projections. So what we need to show, we need to show that C sub K is actually equal to this scalar part of the projection. In other words, V comma V sub K over V sub K comma V sub K. That's what we need to show. Right, and I'm using this form, not, not this guy here with the norm squared. I'm just going to use the one that already has the both being an inner product. So if we can show that CK is equal to this, well, then since we know that the unique, that the constants are already unique, then we know that vector V will be equal to the sum of those projections. Okay, so we need to show this. So let's go ahead and see how we would do that. So we know, right, we can go ahead and use this here 
and inner product that with v sub k. So let's go ahead and consider v comma v sub k, the inner product of that. Well, we know that there are some constants that v is a linear combination with, so we can write this as c1v1 plus c2v2 plus dot 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 cnvn comma v sub k. Now, as we've talked about with inner products, right, if you have a bunch of sums here, you can split that up as each of these inner product with V sub K and then summed up. So this is the same as C1 V1 inner product with V sub K plus C2 V2, a little bit more space there, C2 V2 comma V sub K plus dot dot dot. At some point, you'd have CK VK comma VK inner product plus dot, 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 all the way down to CNVN inner product with V sub K. Now, another property of inner products is that you can pull out those C1, C2, CK, CN. You can pull out a constant. So that would mean that we actually have C1 uh, inner product V1 with VK plus C2 inner product V2 with VK plus dot, 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 CK inner product VK with VK plus da, 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 CN VN VK. Okay, so now notice that we have all these inner products here between V1 VK, V2 VK, VK VK, VN VK. But remember, V1 through VN is not just a basis, it's an orthogonal basis. So every time we have one of these inner products, we have V1 with VK or V2 with VK, we know, since they're supposed to be orthogonal, any distinct pair has to have an inner product that's zero. So this is going to be zero plus zero plus dot, dot, dot. The only one that's not going to be zero is when you have VK with VK. So that'll be CK, VK, comma, VK, plus dot, 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 zero. So what have we figured out then? Well, we figured out that over here, this must equal this. So now we know V inner product with VK is equal to CK VK inner product with VK. Now remember, the inner product of any vector with itself, unless that vector happens to be the zero vector, which it can't be because it exists in a basis this time, must be non-zero. So we can divide this over. So we can get that CK must be V inner product with VK over the inner product of VK with itself. That shows us that the constants must be the constants that are used in these projections. So that means the vector V is the sum of the projections onto that orthogonal basis. And that means we have proven what we wanted to show. So this theorem is a really sort of interesting and sort of powerful theorem that relates to orthogonal bases. What you guys have basically just learned here is that when you have a standard basis, to figure out a component representation, you have to go ahead and actually solve a system of equations that shows you how to represent that vector in terms of the basis set vectors. You know it'll always be solvable because the basis is a basis, but you'd have to solve that system. Here, this is saying that you can actually figure out the component representation by avoiding solving the system and just doing these inner products. The only restriction is that the basis must not just be a basis, it must be an orthogonal basis. So to sort of conclude this section 5.2, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple examples of using this concept of the projection to find the component representation. All right, so for our first example here, we're going to consider the vector space R3 with just the standard inner product, the dot product. We're going to do two things here. We're going to first show that this set is an orthogonal basis for R3, and then we're going to determine the component representation for this guy relative to the above basis. And we will do that using this new concept of the projection. So let's go ahead and see that. For A, we need to show that this is an orthogonal basis. This has the right amount of stuff to be a basis. So since we want to show it's an orthogonal basis, it will suffice to show that these guys are orthogonal. Remember, we proved in the previous video that if these guys are orthogonal, they're automatically linearly independent. Since the number of vectors matches the dimension of R3, if you're linearly independent, you also automatically span. Since they will be an orthogonal, linearly independent spanning set, they will be an orthogonal basis. So we only need to show that they're orthogonal. 
So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and do our first inner product. We've got to do the first guy with these two. So that'll be two. And then we'll have to do this guy with this guy. So there'll be three computations here. So let's do one, one, zero and one, negative one, one. The inner product here will be one uh, times one plus one times negative one plus zero times one which looks like it's going to be 1 minus 1 plus 0, which is 0. Check. So these first two vectors are orthogonal. Let's do the next pairing, 1, 1, 0, and 1, negative 1, negative 2. That looks like it's going to be 1 times 1 plus 1 times negative 1 plus 0 times negative 2, which is going to be 1 minus 1 plus 0, which is 0. Check. So our first vector is orthogonal to both of these. Now we need to check that the second vector is orthogonal to the third. So 1, negative 1, 1, comma, 1, negative 1, negative 2. That looks like it's going to be 1 times 1 plus negative 1 times negative 1 plus 1 times negative 2, which is 1 plus 1 minus 2, which is 0. Check. So this set is orthogonal since number of vectors equals dimension of r3, which is 3. This implies basis, oh, specifically orthogonal basis. Check. OK, so we did it. We found out that this guy really is an orthogonal basis. All right. So for convenience, right, uh, as we start to do this component representation, let's just quickly sort of name this guy V1, this guy V2, and this guy V3. Okay, now remember, when you do component representations, the order in which the vectors are written matters, right, because you're treating it as an ordered basis. So for B, what we just proved from the previous theorem is that V, if we call this guy V here, must be equal to the projection of V onto V1, plus v onto v2, plus the projection of v onto v3. Which means that v, in this case, must be the inner product of v and v1 over v1 with v1 times v1, plus v and v2 inner product over v2 and v2 with v2, plus v v3 inner product over v3 comma v3 times v3. If you guys then think about it, right, these are your basis elements. These are your component representations. Those are your actual constants there. So these are the things that we actually need to determine here. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure those out. So if we want to do uh, vv1 over v1 with v1, I guess that means we would be doing the inner product. V was uh, 1, 3, negative 1. So 1, 3, negative 1. Along with V1, which I believe was 1, 1, 0. So 1, 1, 0. We'll have to do that inner product. And then divide by the inner product of 1, 1, 0 with 1, 1, zero with itself. Okay, up top we're just doing standard dot product, so one times one, three times one, and negative one times zero. That sounds like up top we're gonna get four, and in the bottom, one times one, one times one, that sum those up, you should get two, and that is gonna be equal to two. So the first component representation should be two there. For the second one, v, v2 over v2 with v2, well, uh, v2, I believe, was 1, negative 1, 1. So that means we're doing the inner product of 1, 3, negative 1, and 1, negative 1, 1. Okay, close that up. And then divide it by the inner product of 1, negative 1, 1, with itself 1, negative 1, 1. Okay, up top, looks like we're going to get 1, minus 3, and then minus 1, so that sounds like negative 3. And in the bottom, 1, 1, 1, so 3, and that equals negative 1 there. 
Last one we got to do is V, V3 over V3, V3. That would be the inner product of 1, 3, minus 1, along with uh, the third guy was 1, negative 1, uh, negative 2. So 1, negative 1, negative 2, divided by the inner product of 1, negative 1, negative 2, with 1, negative 1, negative 2. Okay, up top, it looks like we're going to get 1 and then negative 3 and then 2, up, which sounds like 0. And then in the bottom, it really won't matter, but we could do it real quick. It's 1, 2, and 4, so 6, which equals 0. So the component representation would be 2 minus 1, 0. In other words, if we were writing that like we were back in the section we sort of introduced this, which I believe is 4.7, we would say v sub b here is the column vector 2 minus 1, 0. So in other words, you need 2 of this first vector, one of uh, negative 1 of this second vector, and 0 of this third vector to build this guy. If you guys want, on your own, you can set up the system of equations. You can say this equals c1 times this, c2 times this, c3 times this. Solve that out, and you will get that c1 has to be 2, c3 has to be negative 1, uh, and c3 has to be 0. Sorry, c1 has to be 2, c2 has to be negative 1, and c3 has to be 0. But notice that this gives us a way of avoiding the system of equations and just doing these inner product computations to solve for that component representation. Okay. So that was pretty, pretty uh, sort of quick and easy to do that. Let's try that one more time with sort of one of the more non-standard inner products that we worked with specifically on the polynomial space. All right. So we're going to consider the vector space P2 of R with the inner product where you take P of X and Q of X and you do it at the, your inner product as the integral from negative 1 to 1, P of X times Q of X dx. We're going to again begin by showing that this is an orthogonal basis, and then we're going to determine the component representation for this polynomial relative to this basis. So let's go ahead and see if we can do that. So to start off with, we're going to do the same thing, right? The dimension of P2 of R is 3. We have three vectors here. All we really need to show is that these three vectors are orthogonal. That'll show that they're linearly independent. And since the number of vectors matches the dimension, that'll assure that it's a spanning set. And it'll assure that it's a orthogonal basis. So let's go ahead and start with x squared and 5x squared minus 3, their inner product. That's going to be the integral from negative 1 to 1, x squared and 5x squared minus 3 dx which looks like we're going to be integrating from negative 1 to 1, uh, 5x to the 4th, uh, minus 3x squared dx, which looks like we're going to be taking x to the 5th minus x cubed, evaluated from minus 1 to 1. If we plug in 1, it looks like we get 1 minus 1 minus minus 1 plus 1. Well, that is going to be 0. Check. So that first pair of polynomials is orthogonal given this inner product. Let's go ahead and look at the next pair. So x squared and x, integral negative 1 to 1, uh, x squared times x dx. That's the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x cubed dx, which is equal to 1 fourth x to the fourth integrate, uh, evaluated from negative 1 to 1, which is going to be 1 fourth minus 1 fourth, which is equal to 0. Check. And then finally, the last pairing that we need to check is we need to check the second and third vectors. So we need to do 5x squared minus 3 and x. That's going to be the integral from negative 1 to 1, 5x squared minus 3 times x dx, which is the integral from negative 1 to 1, 5x cubed minus 3x dx which sounds like it's going to be 5 over 4 x to the 4th minus 3 halves x squared, evaluated from minus 1 to 1. Pop those guys in there. That's 5 fourths minus 3 halves minus 5 fourths minus 3 halves, because when we plug in negative 1, both of these are even exponents, so it's going to be the same thing. Uh, some messy fractions in there, but it doesn't matter because this is the same as this. So that equals 0. Check. So there we go. We've now shown that this set is certainly orthogonal, so it is an orthogonal basis. This set is orthogonal basis. Check. Okay. 
So let's do the same sort of naming convention. We'll call this guy V1, this guy V2, this guy V3, and we'll call this V. So that component representation for B, the first thing we will need to do is determine V onto V1 divided by V1 with itself, V1. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, to do V in V1, we're going to have to do the integral from negative 1 to 1. V is that 4x squared uh, plus 2x minus 3 uh, times V1, which I believe was just x squared. Okay, dx over the integral from negative 1 to 1 of x squared with itself. Okay, if we do that up top, we get the integral from negative 1 to 1. Looks like we get 4x to the 4th plus 2x cubed minus 3x squared dx over the integral from negative 1 to 1 uh, of x to the 4th dx. So integrating those, it looks like we should get 4 fifths x to the 5th uh, plus 1 half x to the 4th minus x cubed evaluated from minus 1 to 1. And down here, looks like we should get 1 fifth x to the 5th evaluated from negative 1 to 1. So up top, it looks like we get 4 fifths plus 1 half minus 1 and then minus uh, negative 4 fifths plus 1 half. Mm, and then when we plug in minus 1, looks like minus 1. And then in the denominator, we get 1 fifth minus negative 1 fifth. So a little bit messy, but we know that these guys will cancel out. But it looks like we get something like uh, 8 fifths. Oh, and sorry, this guy here should be a plus 1, right? Because when we plug the negative 1, we got negative 1, but it was negated, so it should be a plus 1 there. Uh, 8 fifths minus 2 over, uh, looks like 2 fifths there. And I guess we can sort of do that. That should be what? Uh, 8 fifths minus 2. That's 10 fifths. That's negative 2 fifths over 2 fifths. Sounds like negative 1 for all that trouble. Okay, so our first component representation is supposed to be a negative 1. We can do our next one, v with v2 over v2 comma v2, which means that we'll need to do the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 4x squared plus 2x minus 3. V2 was 5x squared minus 3, I believe. Yep, 5x squared minus 3. dx over the integral from negative 1 to 1, 5x squared minus 3 times 5x squared minus 3 dx. So a little bit messy, but we should be able to do that. We can FOIL that out. Uh, looks like we should get like a 20x to the 4th. Uh, then looks like we should get a 10 x cubed. Uh, then it looks like we should get a negative 15 x squared along with a negative 12 x squared. So a negative 27 x squared. Uh, then a looks like a minus 6 x and a plus 9 dx. And then down here we have the integral from negative 1 to 1. Looks like we should get a 25 x to the fourth minus 30 x uh, squared plus 9 dx. Okay, we'll need a little bit more space to finish this up. But we can go ahead and do that. We'll just grab that. Put that onto our next page here. Expand that up a little bit. Okay. Alrighty. So we've got that right there. We're now ready to go ahead and integrate that. Uh, looks like we should get 4x to the fifth uh, plus 10 over 4x to the fourth minus 9x cubed uh, minus 3x squared plus 9x evaluated from minus 1 to 1 all over down here looks like we should get 5x to the fifth minus 10x uh, cubed plus 9x evaluated from minus 1 to 1. All right, plugging in here, we should be sort of recognizing that any of these sort of even ones won't contribute anything, and any of the odd ones end up getting doubled. 
So it looks like we should end up with 8 uh, minus 18 uh, plus 18 overall up there once you evaluate. And down here, same trick, any of the odd exponents are just going to be doubled. So it looks like we should get 10 minus 20 plus 18. So ultimately, it looks like we're going to end up with 8 over, uh, what should that be, negative 10, 8 which looks like we should get a 1 there. So component representation for the second piece should be a 1. Okay, last one that we need to do is we need to evaluate v with v3 as an inner product over v3 with itself. So that means up top we'll need to integrate negative 1 to 1. v here uh, was that, what was that? Uh, 4x squared plus 2x plus 3 minus 3, 4x squared plus 2x minus 3, along with v3, which is x dx, over the integral from negative 1 to 1, x, x dx. So that's the integral from negative 1 to 1, 4x cubed uh, plus 2x squared minus 3x dx, over the integral from negative 1 to 1, x squared dx. We can go ahead and integrate. And we should get x to the fourth plus 2 thirds x cubed minus 3 halves x squared evaluated from minus 1 to 1. And down below, we should get 1 third x cubed evaluated from minus 1 to 1. Evaluating that, you should see that you get 4 thirds up top because, again, these guys will just drop out and this guy will get doubled. And down here, we should get 2 thirds. That gives you a component representation of 2. So, in summary, we can see that vector v, according to this basis, would be the column vector. Looks like we found negative 1 as our first one, 1, and 2. So, negative 1, 1, 2. Well, that there shows you guys how to use the projections to determine uh, the component representation given an orthogonal basis. In our next video, we'll be moving on to section 5.3. And in 5.3, we'll see how to take any basis and build an orthogonal basis out of it.